Isn't this exciting to be able to be here in Holy Week and on Monday, Thursday, Mons giving of alms and the Lord giving himself to us in the body and blood through Holy Communion. And to be welcoming all of you who are parents and grandparents of these wonderful children who are going to help us in our worship tonight. It's going to be a wonderful experience for us as we kind of relive the painting of Leonardo da Vinci and put some extra meaning into it and understanding of it uh, on that night in which our Lord was betrayed. And we're thinking about that deeply. So we welcome you and welcome those who are online. I'm Norbert Ash. I have the privilege of being able to be a member here and uh, to be colleagues with my dear pastor, uh, Drew Ross, and the staff of this church and school. Um, we will be having Holy Communion tonight and doing it a little bit different, kind of family style. And so what we're envisioning is that as you come up, you will kind of form around this table on the three sides, and those who are distributing it will hand to the first person the patent with the bread, and then you, you give that to one another all the way around like you would in a family. And then would come the communion uh, with, a, with a wine as well, right behind that, okay? And then a blessing will be given to you and you go back to your seats. Okay, same thing will be over on this side. So you would go all around all the sides and then it'll be passed and you pass it on, okay? Um, we're ready to worship. Are you ready? I am. And uh, why don't we stand for our opening hymn?
Leonardo da Vinci captured the power and the emotion of the Last Supper in this famous painting. The painting was not intended as a faithful reproduction of the original scene, although the setting and the appearance of the table is from the 16th century, his painting still captures the moment. In a dark upper room in the first century Palestine, Jesus has just said and told his disciples that one of them would betray him. In the surprise of the moment, the artist has Peter draw his sword, asks John to question the master for the the identification of the betrayer, and we see a salt shaker overturned. While the disciples' minds are whirling, the master remains calm, the center of the universe. Let's go back to that moment prior to this painting. While the evening meal was being served, Jesus got up, took off his outer cloak, tied a cloth around his waist, poured water into a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet. This was a very intimate and traditional act that was done by wives for their husbands, children for their parents, Disciples for their masters, or slaves for whom they served, definitely not for the master to do. But Jesus knew that his father had put all things under his power, which really means literally into his hands. Jesus was sharing in a divine essence of the father, and this led him to wash the feet Jesus did what the Father does, and this time he washes feet, even the feet of the one who would betray him. He humbled himself in this act, and he instructed his disciples to do the same, wash one another's feet, meaning share the act of love of the Father with others in all things. When I sent for you men to prepare this Passover feast, I had told you that my hour is at hand. I long to spend this meal with you, celebrating the Passover, especially this meal which exists before my suffering. I will not taste of this meal again until its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Thank you, Father, for this bread. Now take and eat. This is my body, given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sin. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Father, for the blessing of this wine. And now take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which has been shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. Nathaniel is my real name, although I'm also known as Bartholomew. I was born in Cana of Galilee, and like most of us, I was a fisherman. Philip and I are close companions, and it was he who first brought me to Jesus. I will never forget the question I put to Philip that day. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? For it was such a small, insignificant place. But after seeing Jesus, he said to me, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. How do you know me? I asked. He answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. After hearing this, I had no doubt he was the Messiah. Since then I have served him, walking the villages of Galilee, watching him turn water into wine, going down the streets of the Decapolis, and finally the holy city Jerusalem. And now, when he is instituting a ceremony to take the place of the Passover, he tells us that one of us is to betray him. Who can it be? Could it be Nathaniel? Is it I? Is it I? I was given the name Simon the Zealot. I was associated with a group of bloodthirsty, hot-headed rebels called the Zealots. We feared and hated the Romans and would settle for nothing less than the violent expulsion of Rome from our beloved land. I lived by the sword, and if not for Jesus, I would have died by the sword. One day, I heard Jesus say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God, and you shall love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you? After meeting Jesus, I have unconditionally surrendered to his will, and I now follow him wherever he leads. Through Jesus, we will one day bring our blessed land back to the glory of God intended it to have. As I watch Jesus conquer evil with unconditional love, I realized how powerful a sword that love can be. With love in my heart, I can overcome any adversity I have to face. And now, he says there is a spiritual Roman among us? One who would attempt by force what can only be conquered by love? Who can he be? Matthew, the publican? Peter, the big fisherman? Or does he suspect me, since I am a former zealot? Is it I? Is it I? My name is James, but since I am smaller than most of my companion, I am called James the Lesser. Daddy and I are brothers, and together, we first saw the Master on the day John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus. I was curious to see what was happening, so I turned aside for a closer look. I saw Jesus asking John to baptize him. After Jesus was baptized by John, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. A mighty voice spoke, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Later, Jesus called me to be one of his disciples, and I have followed him without hesitation. I have tried to learn as much about him and his heavenly father as I can. And now one of us is to betray him? Surely it is madness to think one of us could do this. Surely the betrayer is out of his mind. But then I keep asking myself, is it I? Is it I? My real name is Judas Labius, but to lessen the confusion between me and Judas Iscariot, I am called Thaddeus. I well remember the day Jesus called me. After a night of prayer, he commissioned us to go forth and preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. He told us to be as wise as serpents, as innocent as doves, since he was sending us forth as sheep among wolves. Just a few days ago, Jesus made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem and I was sure his hour had come when he would ascend to the throne of David. But he had just spoken some troublesome words. I suddenly see him astride his donkey, entering Jerusalem not as a king, but as a lamb among wolves. We have had this Passover feast in such secrecy that we are told to look for a man carrying a pitcher to know the place. I am afraid for our safety. And now he has said that someone here is to betray him. Is there a wolf among us? Who can it be? 
Is it I? Is it I? I am Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. I am not a gifted man, just a simple fisherman. I have tried to do what I could do to serve the master. The others call me Andrew, the bringer, because it seems my talent is to bring others to Jesus. I brought my brother Peter to Jesus. And I have watched with satisfaction the glorious transformation of his life. I found the little lad with five loaves and two fish that day when Jesus miraculously fed the 5,000. Such miracles. Such love and compassion the Master has for everyone. I have been very close to the Master, but not certainly one of the inner circle. But I do not wish to be. I only wish to serve him, to bring others to him so they can see he is truly the Lamb of God. What a greater gift can life afford a simple fisherman than to be the companion and friend of our Lord. Now, one of his friends is to betray him? Who can it be? Can Andrew, the bringer, be the one to bring down his Lord? Is it I? Is it I? My surname is Levi, but you know me as Matthew, the tax collector. Because of my profession, I have never known friendship or love. And then one day a shadow fell across my collecting table, and I looked up into the face of the master. I saw in those eyes a compassion I had never seen in any man. And trust me, I have looked into the eyes of many men as they paid their due to the government. Follow me, was all Jesus said. I left my table and my life as a tax collector behind and followed him. It was the best bargain of my life. Since then, I have followed Jesus, and I've tried to understand his mission by studying how his life fulfills the words of the prophets who foretold his coming. I have tried to write down the exact words the Master has spoken. I have exchanged my publican wretchedness for the dignity of discipleship. I no longer collect taxes or make change. Instead, I change sinners into saints. Jesus has shown me the way, the truth, and the life. And even as I try to write down the gospel, the good news of his coming, he tells us bad news. One of his most trusted followers is to betray him? Does he suspect me because I was once a tax collector? Is it I? Is it I? I am Judas Iscariot, certainly the most trusted member of the Master's beloved society. I guess it was my past experience with the revolutionaries who plotted to overthrow the government that led Jesus to choose me to follow him. After all, Jesus is the Messiah. He will overthrow the Roman government and establish a new kingdom of powerful messianic leaders. And I, the trusted treasurer of this group, will have the most powerful position— I will control the purse strings. True, for now I dole out scarce resources to the poor, but only because one day we will need them to follow the Messiah without question. There have been times that others have disagreed with my opinion. I still can't get over the waste of that precious perfume that Mary poured all over the Master's feet. It could have brought so many pieces of silver. Yes, the Master has shown signs of, shall I say... Weakness? I understand he must appeal to the poor and the downtrodden, and quite frankly, I think he may need a little prodding to complete his mission. That is why I have 30 pieces of silver to add to my coffers. And now he speaks of a betrayer in our midst? Well, I can tell you, it's not Judas Iscariot. Maybe Peter, or those hot-headed brothers James and John. No, I know my place quietly manipulating things behind the scenes. One day he will thank me for forcing his hands, for forcing the master to save himself at the last minute. No, I'm the hero at this table, not the betrayer. But I'll go along with everyone else and act surprised. I might even ask myself, 
Is it I? Is it I? My name is Philip, and I came from Bethesda in Galilee. Jesus called me to follow him one day when I was listening to the preachings of John the Baptist. I was the fourth disciple chosen, and I brought Nathaniel to the master. During the years of close fellowship with Jesus, my faith in God has grown. When he fed the 5,000, I asked, where are we to buy the bread that all these may eat? I discovered that our vision and power are so limited until the master moves through us to reach the world with his love and compassion. Because I know the Greek language so well, I am also called the Greek, and I arranged for the Greeks to speak with our master. Through these encounters, I have grown to understand the master's words. In fact, I am convinced that he who has seen Jesus has also seen the Father. Now, having seen the Father through him, he shocks us by saying there is a betrayer in our midst. Does the traitor not know that in betraying Jesus, he is also betraying God? Who can it be? Can it be Philip? Is it I? Is it I? My brother Andrew and I were fishing one day when Jesus walked by and said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We immediately left our nets and followed him. He even gave me my name, Peter, which means the rock. And when I confessed him as the Christ, the son of the living God, he said, On this rock will I build my church. Strange that he would choose me, a hot-headed fisherman with a runaway tongue. Maybe it's my faith. It is strong. Even when I saw Jesus walking on the water, I tried to go to him. True, I lost confidence and began to sink, but my faith in him is unshakable. Until now. Tonight, when I promised to follow him anywhere, he warned me that before the cock crowed twice, I would have denied him three times. He prayed for me because he said Satan wanted to sift me like wheat. Will I deny him tonight before the rooster crows? Will he deny me? Will he close the doors of the kingdom to me? Am I this betrayer he speaks of? If I knew who the scoundrel was, I'd pierce his heart with this knife to prove my love. But what if it were my own heart I pierced? Am I the one? Is it I? Is it I? I have been given the nickname Doubting Thomas by those who know me. Since the days when I was a fisherman with Simon and Andrew, I've been cautious, careful, and certain of my actions. I usually demand proof before I believe. I want to see before committing myself. You see, I'm not a man of doubt. Rather, I am a man of daring. When Mary and Martha sent word to the Lord that their brother Lazarus was dead, Jesus said, let us go to him. Some of the apostles were afraid to go because of the growing opposition to Jesus. But I was the one who spoke out and rebuked them all by saying, let us all go to him that we may die with him. Why do people overlook my daringness and instead remember the doubting or the questions? They tend to overlook the affirmations. Jesus' enemies are determined to destroy him. Why? Because the God he reveals is a greater God than the petty little man-made deities they have enshrined upon the altars of their hearts. Jesus would bring us all up to God while his enemies would cut God down to their own size. And now Jesus has brought doubt back into my heart when he says that one of us is to betray him? Is he blaming me for lack of faith, lack of courage? Is it I? Is it I? I remember the first time Jesus called to me, John. My brother James and I were mending our nets on our father's boat when Jesus told us to follow him. We were so excited. We dropped everything and followed him. Since that time, I have tried to understand Jesus through his love, something very hard for a man of my impetuous, fiery spirit to do. But the love of the master has changed me, and now he calls me the beloved disciple. Jesus once said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Now this is true sacrificial love. 
He has given so much for us. And like the good shepherd, he protects us and loves us. Someday, I want to share with the world about our good shepherd so that they will believe that he is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, they may have eternal life. For he said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And now he just said one of us will betray him. Can a sheep betray his own shepherd? Is there a wolf in the fold? Surely it is not my brother, or Peter, or Andrew. Could it be John, the beloved disciple? Is it I? Is it I? I am James, the brother of John, and we have often been referred to as the Sons of Thunder. We were fishermen with our father Zebedee, and we were honored when Jesus wanted us as his disciples. I was present in Peter's home when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. Later, I watched as he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. But the most astonishing event occurred on the Mount of Transfiguration when we saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. Our mother urged us to petition Jesus to allow us to sit on either side of him in his kingdom. Jesus replied, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Jesus reminded us that he who would be first must be servant of all, and he demonstrated his words by washing our feet. I have always tried to represent the highest power in the strongest quality, love. And now, he who has taught us the way of love is to be betrayed by one of those whom he loved. Who can it be? Why should one of us do such a thing? Is it I? Is it I? Ask him which one he means. Lord, who is it? The one who dips his hand in the bowl with me is he. Is it I? What you are about to do, do quickly. Only now has the Son of Man been glorified, and God has been glorified in Him. This is my command. Love each other as I have loved you. There is no greater love than this, than one who lays down his life for his friends.
Church, what a beautiful night it is to be able to worship together, to honor what our Savior Jesus has accomplished for us, but especially on a night like this, Monday Thursday, to honor and to receive the meal that Jesus has prepared for us, that it might be received by us for the forgiveness of all of our sin. It'd be my honor to be able to lead us tonight now in a moment of confession and absolution, the Lord's Prayer, and finally the preparation of the Lord's Supper to be received by you and me for the forgiveness of our sin. If you'd please assume a posture of prayer, we pray before our God. Lord God Almighty, we are so grateful for nights like tonight where we can be mindful of the forgiveness of our sins that we need. In fact, we witness Judas running away from his sin, and we could point to him and say, look at Judas, I would never. And yet at the same time, look inwardly into the depths of our heart and say, but I have many, many times, and for that I'm sorry. Heavenly Father, we ask that you too would look into the depths of our heart, that you would bear witness to our sinfulness and recognize once again that we need Jesus. We need your son. We need the hope that comes from him and the forgiveness that can only be offered to us through his death on the cross. Therefore, tonight, while we are sorrowful for his death, we're also grateful. We're thankful because it's through Jesus that we may have forgiveness. And tonight, O church, as we have prayed and as our Heavenly Father has heard our confession, here is now the appropriate words for you to hear. You are forgiven because of Jesus, because we have a Savior, because he has died on the cross, because he has risen from the grave. You may have forgiveness tonight. Therefore, worship, even depart from this place, knowing that you truly are forgiven of all of your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear us now, Lord, as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Allow me to prepare the meal to be received by you and by me. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night on which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, which has been shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sin. Therefore, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of our Lord Jesus be with you always. Thank you so much. Church, we're going to take a moment now to receive the Lord's Supper. You receive some notes ahead of time. I want to simply remind you that as our ushers usher you forward, if you're on this side, you'll be ushered to join me around this table. You can simply stand around the table and we'll receive the elements of the Lord's Supper family style. So I'll simply take the the plate, pass it to you, ask you to receive, say take and eat the body of Christ for you. If you would then, after having received the bread, take the plate, pass it to the next person next to you and tell them, Take and eat the body of Christ for you. The wine will then follow. I'll hold the tray, or an elder will hold the tray. It's somewhat heavy. We'll hold the tray, but will you please speak to the person next to you? Take and drink the blood of Jesus shed for you. With that being said, we receive the Lord's Supper, especially for those of you online. If I could take a moment now and serve you, for those of you who are worshiping away from here, if you'd please take the bread that you have, receive it. While hearing these words, take and eat the body of Christ given for you. If you'd please now take the wine or the grape juice that you have, receive it on this Monday Thursday. Take and drink the blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sin. And now may this body and this blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Jesus has set you free. Church, welcome to the Lord's table.
what an honor it is to receive the Lord's Supper here tonight, family style. Thank you for receiving it from one another tonight. We do take a moment now also to gather our offering. We do so still with the normal means like what we would do uh, on a Sunday morning as well with online giving text to give a reminder for those of you who are here in the house. There's a spot back there in the lobby as well. You can also continue to turn in your worship cards if you'd like to do that. But while we gather our offering, while we turn in our worship cards, we also turn our attention now towards our chamber choir who leads us in some music. Thank you, Chamber Choir. Church, will you please stand to receive this closing benediction? Now, church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon each of you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing our closing hymn.
thank you all for worshiping here tonight. We do invite you to continue this Lenten Holy Week journey with us as we worship with a beautiful Good Friday service tomorrow evening right here at 7 o'clock. And of course on Easter morning, 6.30, 8.30, and 10.30, we can't wait to be with you through the whole journey. Listen, be peaceful tonight. So glad that you're here. I love you all so much. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.